Good evening and thanks for joining us for the special Earth Care edition of Breaking the News. We started our Earth Care segment as a way to talk about how climate change affects our state and how our state is doing its part to make a change. Tonight we're going to start with our daily commute on the roads we drive on. What if we could make them better, last longer, and make them less harmful to our planet? Well, MnDOT has been working on that for decades. Here's Gordon. Every day, thousands of drivers head north on I-94 near Monticello, unaware that every mile they drive is being studied. We're trying to make our roads last longer. A goal Glenn Engstrom has been working on for nearly 30 years here at Min Road. Well, there's really nothing like this in the world. A state-of-the-art facility where they test new ideas to build a better road. These are some of the original samples from when Min Road was built and opened in 1994. The very first road they built. Since then, they've tried out hundreds of ideas, and it's all stored here for future generations to learn from. Each of them has a different mix. Most of them don't work out. We like failures to a certain extent, so we can see what happened, how this failed. But every so often, they come across a game-changing idea like creating weight restrictions during springtime when the road is still thawing out. We've done calculations showing that we saved about $14 million a year in damage to roads. And new ways to recycle old roads, like grinding them up and mixing it in with the new ones. And in some situations, they can save the base layer of a road and build on top of it, saving thousands of tons of concrete and millions of dollars. Thanks to their research, the modern day road is now cheaper, thinner, and in many cases, stronger. And they perform at least the same as our previous designs and generally better. They test their ideas on two different tracks. This one is their low volume loop, meant to mimic city and county roads. They load up a semi with metal weights, totaling 80,000 pounds, and their driver drives that loop eight hours a day five days a week. When he's driving, he gets 50, 60, 70 laps a day. To test out highways and interstates, they have their I-94 test track. One side where the cars are driving right now is mostly an ordinary road. The other side is split into several sections to test out new ideas. Their first road went in in 1994. They studied the different sections, tore them out, and put in a second batch around 2008. Now they're working on their third batch workers laying down fiber optic cables and sensors so they can test things like temperature, moisture, and pressure. Their plan is to have this stretch of road wrapped up and ready to go by the end of September. And when that happens, they'll start bringing the traffic over here every so often, alternating the traffic between both types of roads to get data over here where their sensors are. Now there are 35 different sections of road over here, and each of those sections is just slightly different with the kind of material that they use. So when when you're driving over here, every 250 feet you'll be driving on a different type of road, but you won't even know it. We can really do a lot of neat stuff out there. And Glenn says many of the best ideas are still coming in, like blending in different types of fiber and recycled material to make the road stronger. One company they're working with has the idea of mixing in recycled pop bottles. 150,000 of those in a mile that they can recycle into the product. So that's really exciting. Who knows, the next big breakthrough could be in one of these 35 new sections on I-94. In 10 or 15 years, we'll find out. We're just touching the surface here. Gordon Severson, CARE 11 News. From our daily commute to our everyday needs, Minnesota now has two stores aimed at cutting down waste associated with the things that we buy. Tear Market got its start in South Minneapolis and expanded to Northeast Minneapolis in April, and Heidi Wigdahl got to take a peek. At Tear Market in South Minneapolis, nothing goes to waste. I started to learn about the carbon footprint of our trash and where our waste actually goes. And I realized that I hadn't been living as sustainably as I thought I had. Because there is such a large carbon footprint associated with recycling in our trash system. So Amber Hockadal, on a mission to fight climate change, opened Tear Market three years ago. Minnesota's first zero waste store. This is kind of a pioneer. It's one of a few in the United States as well. So we're really paving the way. The store has more than 100 bulk food items. Then you put your container on there and then that is the tear weight. So that's the weight of the vessels. You can bring in your own containers to fill 
or use one of theirs on a deposit system. And you get uh, $2.99 back by bringing the jar back. From cleaning products. It's laundry detergent in just a sheet form. To local favorites like High Bar. They make a shampoo and conditioner bar. Our other products that come in packaging are all plastic free. So they're either in recycle packaging or compostable packaging. Tear Market is now expanding, opening a second store in Northeast Minneapolis on Earth Day. Crowdfunding helped launch both stores. And I'm definitely pro, like, sustainable, as low waste as possible. It's not going to be perfect. I'm not perfect by any means, but I feel better knowing that, you know, I'm putting my money to a good place. Meeting people where they're at. For example, a simple swap, replacing a plastic toothbrush with bamboo. And if we get everyone making one or two swaps, that will make a huge difference in the amount of trash they create, and that will reduce the carbon footprint and really help fight climate change. In South Minneapolis, Heidi Wigdahl, CARE 11 News. Through summer and the fall, we were talking a lot about drought, especially out west. Some people in California had their eyes on our 10,000 lakes, thinking our water could be their solution to the drought. Once again, here's Gordon. Water is a funny thing. Too much and you've got flooding. Too little, you've got drought. So it makes sense to think that if one area has too much and another too little, why not share it, right? Don't they have extra water? Uh, aren't they land at 10,000 lakes? Frederick Mello says that's what many Southern Californians are thinking right now. He writes for the Pioneer Press and recently wrote an in-depth article about some interesting ideas being floated around in Palm Springs. Where did all of this start? So letters have been coming in to the Desert Sun in Palm Springs, kind of a small daily newspaper. And in uh, late June, one of the letters came from a resident of Las Vegas who said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we just um, diverted some water from the Mississippi River by canals and aqueducts, sent it over to the Colorado River, and started basically irrigating the Southwest. Mello says that first letter to the Desert Sun drew in 75,000 hits to their website. Not bad for a paper with a circulation of 20 to 50,000 copies. But then other letters came in with similar ideas and it snowballed from there. How big has this conversation gotten down in Palm Springs? And in July, they had a letter uh, that got picked up by Google Feed that had uh, 475,000 hits. It sounds like a really interesting and kind of an odd request, but a lot of these people seem to think that this would work. There, there's a lot of enthusiasm on that letters page, uh, and it's been going from June into July with folks thinking of different ways, uh, railroad, um, can canals. But not everyone is on board with this idea, especially Minnesotans. Many of them have also sent letters to the newspaper saying, You can't have our water, you'll never get our water. There's practical reasons, but there's also just kind of this general territorial sense that, hey, that's ours, hands off. It's not the first time an idea like this has come up. Mello says a few years ago, a company in Lakeville had plans to do this on a very big scale. And they had, they had drawn up a request for a permit to do about 500 million gallons uh, a year to the Southwest. So they were actually gonna take it by railroad. But it never happened. And according to the DNR, it may never happen. In a statement, the agency says siphoning water would have negative impacts, and Minnesota does not inherently have an overabundance of water. Case in point, last year's drought that affected most of the state. Plus, the DNR says per state law, they can't send more than a million gallons of water further than 50 miles. So, contrary to what some in Palm Springs might think, the water here in Minnesota is going to stay here, at least for the foreseeable future. We have farms, we have waterways with endangered species that have to be maintained. We have all kinds of issues here that, that we need to uh, protect and, and be aware of. Coming up, scientists are taking us behind the scenes as they watch the changing climate in our state, keeping an eye on invasive species on the ground from 700 miles above. Taking a look at what climate change could do to our Minnesota forests. Stay with us. What is near me? If you're out at UC News near you, just open the CARE 11 app and go to near me at the bottom right. Then tap share with us. Upload your photo or video and tell us about it. Hit submit. And once you see success, your news has reached our team at CARE 11 News. Invasive bugs and plants are a big problem for our state's ecosystem. Now to keep track of invasive species on the ground, scientists in our area are turning their eyes to the sky. Here's Morgan Wolf.
an extended bloom. Putting in time, especially like in the shaded region, to get ahead of a problem. The days wouldn't line up. It's what University of Minnesota researcher Ryan Briscoe Runquist says could save Minnesota millions of dollars when it comes to invasive plants. Well, unfortunately, Minnesota has a lot of invasive plants. Probably some that people are most familiar with are things like buckthorn, garlic mustard. The species that we're working on for this project is called leafy spurge. So all of these areas that you see highlighted in blue is where our model is able to actually detect leafy spurge. This image you're looking at, it was taken by a satellite flying 700 miles above Earth. Which is absolutely amazing, yeah, just to think about the imaging capability of these satellites. The goal of the research is to use this satellite picture to predict where leafy spurge can spread. It's deadly for cattle to eat. It's also highly resistant to pesticides. So this research isn't just about saving animals' lives. It's also about time and money. Which is really the biggest part of the research. Helping the environment from the sky. Where's the blue one that you had, though? By pinpointing with a map. And where leafy spurge might go under uh, climate change. Like, what are places that are at risk for new invasion? In St. Paul, Morgan Wolf. What can you see? Care 11 News. Now, they aren't just watching invasive species. They're looking at the native Minnesota forests as well. Our state sits in a unique spot between climate zones, which makes it a pretty great place to study how climate change will affect forests in the coming decades. Over the summer, photojournalist David Porter followed along in Cloquet. That's a pretty nice root system. The research project is looking at the effect of climate. Like H1? On trees. 204. Here in northern Minnesota, we are in a transition zone between two big biomes. Boreal forest to the north, we have a temperate forest to the south. Between Hinkley and Canadian border is that entire transition. Species that represent temperate forest are buroak, maples for the boreal forest, aspen, jack pine. What we want to do is want to learn how those plants are affected by the warming and how that translates to their growth and survival. Well, we got to plant two more right now. Every three to four years, we plant new seedlings. But there's only like three missing on each of the other plus. Those posts hold the infrared heaters. We also have buried warming cable to heat those plants which grow in this plot above and below ground. So the leaves and the roots are being heated to a specific degree. We have three temperature treatments. Plots which are completely controlled, which monitors that ambient temperature. Plots which elevates the temperature for roughly two degrees Celsius. On top of that, we also have a treatment where we rise temperatures three and a half degrees. The two and three and a half degrees is our projections which roughly match those different scenarios in accordance to the emissions. What is in here is a simple data logger with a number of sensors attached to it. All those cables go to different plots. This data logger, every five seconds, checks the temperature in this ambient plot and compares to the temperature to that heated plot. It's either sending information to the heaters to heat it up or shut it down in order to maintain that temperature differential at the right level. And we do this 24-7 over the course of the entire growing season, almost 14 years here on this project, to find out which direction this climate will take this current forest. Let's say it's when they fully expanded. We are monitoring their physiology. What kind of oak is that? So how well they are performing. East of the cage. How much carbon they are absorbing, how much carbon they are releasing, how well they survive, so how tall they grow. 21. We see that all plants are adjusting. However, not all the plants are adjusting the same way. 99 for the white pine. In general, boreal tree species are disfavored by the new warmer environment. They have a poorer survival. You got any spruces over there? Temperate species do better. Some of the plants which are growing in that warmer world, they are experiencing a little bit longer growing season. They leaf out five to 10 days on average earlier in the spring. There is a quimacy right here. And they also senesce a little bit later in the fall. Everything is accounted for. Which can give them some advantage assuming that there is plenty of water available to them. Forestry is a pretty important element of Minnesota economy, not only from the perspective of timber production, but also those socioeconomic aesthetic values. We all like boundary waters. We all wanted that beautiful boreal forest what we see on those lakes up north. So the question is, will we see this forest? Will be able to produce that timber? Whether they will be able to regenerate and survive, whether we'll have those forests here? or they will transform to something different.
Since then, the team has released some of their preliminary findings, and they say even a little bit of warming could vastly change what our forests in northern Minnesota and Canada can look like. For example, when they made it hotter and drier, a lot of the trees that are unique to that part of our state struggled to live. And those that did, they didn't grow to be quite as big. Meanwhile, with a little bit more rain, a lot of trees that are more common to our south could move in. They're going to continue plugging in scenarios to see what changes come and with what variables. We'll be right back. I couldn't have imagined just what our investigation would reveal. Felt like I had witnessed a murder and I resigned immediately. People left to suffer. Don't leave me in here. Begging for help. Sam, so much pain. Ignored until too late. A jail sentence shouldn't be a death sentence. Cruel and unusual. Available now, wherever you listen to podcasts. Across the country, thousands of volunteers help our National Weather Service track trends by literally writing down the daily weather in their area. And there's one family in the small town of Milan who's been doing it longer than anybody else in the state. Jennifer Austin explains. As familiar as the wind in western Minnesota is the man in Milan who consistently watches the weather. And the current temperature is 37. Luther Opjordan has been checking the weather station in his backyard for almost 40 years. You don't even think about it anymore, you just do it. It becomes a habit. A habit. This was the annual report from 1932. That stretches back longer than Luther's life. This is the oldest record in the family, August of 1983. First month's weather report that was sent in by my grandpa. OK Op Jordan started recording Milan's weather in 1893 when the National Weather Service was looking for volunteers for a new weather observing network. Luther's dad Torfin took the reins for decades more, every day recording Milan's temperature and precipitation from the station in the family's backyard. 46,000 observations. At 7 a.m. it was 70 degrees. Three generations, 129 years. Longest in Minnesota. Yep, absolutely. Michelle Margraf leads the program in Minnesota, now with 192 volunteers. The 30-year average. Recordings from across the Twin Cities and greater Minnesota help track trends in the state's climate. It's found what? But we are seeing that overall pattern of warmness when we compare the urban and the rural. Which tells you what? That you're seeing them in both places? Well, it tells us that it's not just an urban effect. It's more of a general warming than just a city warming. Climate change. Cl yeah, the climate is changing. Change. That was given to my father for 50 years of service with the Weather Service. As Luther hopes the tradition in Milan keeps going. I've got three boys and some grandkids. Jennifer Austin, CARE 11 News. Stay with us. We're going to showcase some of the photos you have sent us that we think perfectly showcase the beauty Minnesota and this planet we call home has. 15 years of storytelling, hundreds of videos, all in one place. Land of 10,000 stories, the complete collection. Rewatch your favorite stories or use the interactive map to find new stories across our state. Go to care11.com slash land. Be warned before the storm. The CARE 11 Weather Warn Day signals a change coming for your weather. Because winter is challenging, the weather warn symbol lets you know when to be prepared. Be warned before the storm with CARE 11 Weather Warn. That's so Minnesota was something, well, we all just say. When a person passes us with an ope or no one takes that last slice of pizza. But beyond it being a catch-all of our isms, it's also a Facebook page where you can post those moments and photos that make this state special. And in addition to the people, it's the place itself, the beautiful land and sky and water, the native land, the boundary waters, the loons, the sunrises, the sunsets, and the northern lakes. It's all so Minnesota and so beautiful. Thank you for being good stewards of it and sharing it with everyone on our page and on our air. Take care.